Paneloids Podcast. Jeremiah and Kyle here with our very special super guest, a man who has a hankering for writing aliens, let them be xenomorphs, Kryptonians, or symbiotes, the Eisner-nominated Sergeant First Class Philip Kennedy Johnson. How are you doing, sir? I'm great, guys. How are you? Doing all right. Let's get right to the questions. Let's start with how did you break into comics? So I'm back to duty Army, and I, I work in the Washington, D.C. area, in the D.C., Baltimore area. And growing up, I wanted to be a comic artist. But I was also very involved in music, and I ended up going the music route professionally and wound up in one of the, the military bands in the Washington, D.C. area. I had a younger brother who was also a musician and artist, and he went the other way. He ended up wanting to be a, a comic artist himself and took it very seriously. But we grew up kind of in the sticks and didn't know much about comic industry or how comics were made. Never been to a proper convention or anything. And uh, he was about maybe 19 or so. 18 or 19. He'd been trying out community college and wasn't loving it and just really wanted to do comics. He was just tired of doing the backup stuff and really wanted to do what he wanted to do, you know? And he just had no idea how to get started. And I kind of felt for him. I just didn't know how to help him. And in the end, we just kind of made this weird plan of we'll figure it out together. We'll educate ourselves and what comics are like and what a script looks like, what a real portfolio looks like, what you need. We'll sort it out. You know, just come up here. You'll just draw all the time. We'll figure out what you have to do. And we totally did that. He moved in with me and we started going to convention. We found a really good comic shop. I mean, I loved comics growing up, and I'd totally fallen out of it and hadn't read one in forever. I mean, I love music, but I was in a place where I kind of needed a new creative outlet. So I just started writing again. I'd loved creative writing, hadn't done it in a long time. I started writing stories for him to illustrate just to give him something to draw. So we started doing pages, and we started going to conventions together and bought literally how to make comics for dummies or something. And other stuff like that that was a little more legit. The Scott McCloud book, a great book by Andy Schmidt, and several others, and just kind of figuring out how was done. That's how I got in. And it was all for his benefit. At some point, he joined the Army, too, as an illustrator. They have a job called Multimedia Illustrator, in which they train you in the software that you need to know, Illustrator and Photoshop and in design, and use those skills for the Army, putting together graphic materials. And he did that. And at some point, he got out and went to art school in the GI Bill. And now he's out there doing it. So that was kind of the whole point of the whole thing. But while he was getting busy with Army stuff, by that time, I'd really gotten the comics bug again. I'd just fallen in love with the art form again. I was looking for other people to work with too. And uh, we put together some pitch packets with various people. And one of those became Last Sons of America, my first published book at Boom Studios. And that led to another Boom book. And those books got noticed at DC and Marvel. And it all kind of snowballed into a proper gig. That's awesome. Thanks. Do you fun. want to shout out that comic book store you guys moved near? Or? Yeah, I live between Annapolis and Baltimore. I work at Fort Meade, but kind of between Baltimore, Annapolis, and D.C. And the store is Third Eye Comics. Of Oh, Steve Anderson's Third yeah, Eye Comics. At the time, it was a really small shop. I'd seen all these little wire signs and the medians of the road and stuff. Buy Third Eye or Die. Yeah, like it was super early. I mean, I don't think he had a proper logo yet or anything. And it was their first shop. And now I think they're on their fourth. And it's massive. It's turned into this crazy Cinderella story. But at the time, it was a very small store. And that's when I met Stephen Trish. Probably one of the best stores on the East Coast. And I will be going in two weeks. I'd say the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's like one of the top five accounts, I think, literally in the world. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's an amazing store. But before we really go deep into comics, you probably told this a lot as well, but you could say how you got into the Army and tell us a little bit about what you do in the band that you travel in, which is also very impressive and equally as cool of a career. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, I got an undergraduate degree and a master's degree in music. Oh. And and when I finished my master's degree, I joined the Glenn Miller Band as a trumpet player. And I was on the road with them for, you know, a year or two and got out. And I always had my eyes on the military bands, like the DC bands, for a long time because I knew they were sweet gigs. And I ended up having some friends that got into them and told me how great they were. And so I auditioned for the Army Field Band in Washington, D.C., and it worked out, and that's how I joined. I auditioned for them as a civilian, and I joined just to, to do this job. When you join one of the premier bands in the Capitol or one of the the academies, like West Point or, or Annapolis, you're not auditioning to be a, in a specific field. You're auditioning for a specific, like, seat. Like, you're auditioning for one job. Everyone who sends in the tape for that gig is trying to get into that band and, and play in that chair. It was competitive, but it worked out, and I've been there ever since then. It's been about 16 and a half years. So, of the D.C. bands, my my band plays primarily on tour. We don't play inside the Capitol Beltway that much. We mostly play on tour for the American people. We're almost like an ambassador type gig. In fact, the musical ambassadors of the army is kind of our, our log line. We travel and just kind of connect America to its army and just tell them the story about what the army's doing on their behalf. Very cool. 
Very cool. Yeah, thanks. It's a good gig. Do you feel that your experience in the Army has influenced your writing in any way? I mean, it's shown in some of your work. Obviously, we see it a lot in your self-published stuff, but how do you feel it affects your licensed stuff at Marvel and DC? My time in the Army has actually, weirdly, has served me in a similar way to how my time as a musician has served me, and that it's all about the concept of the team. Something that they beat into you in basic training is that it's not all about you anymore. It's about the whole team that you're with. There's all these little ways that they kind of let they seed that in you, just from really big, obvious ways to little, little things, like giving this big group a time constraint to do something that is completely unachievable over time, just gradually figuring out how to do it as a group, how to make it achievable as a team, or just little stupid stuff like after a meal, everyone has their tray and they teach you one person gets all the silverware, one gets all the glasses, one gets all the plates, or one gets all the trash, like whatever's left over. And there's this weird system of just making everything a little faster, doing things more efficiently than everyone could do by themselves. Just every little detail of your day is broken down in such a way that they kind of make you feel like part of the team and you help the team achieve and not yourself anymore. That is something that you learn in music as well in a much less tangible, obvious way. Whenever you're playing music, your ears just have to grow and grow as you play and just devour everything you're hearing, just trying to lose your identity in the sound of the group and trying to make the length of every note and the intonation and the waves, the vibrato and the sound, make everything just fit into the, the blend of everything else. That's one voice that comes out. So in both cases, it's taught me how a collaboration should work. You can't just finish your part of a thing and just send it and then your part is done and someone else can do what they want with it. That's not how it should be. Like the collaboration should continue all the way through the process. And that can be challenging in comics because the different steps in the creation of a comic happen individually. I write my script, that goes to the penciler, they pencil it, and the inker, who's sometimes the same person, but not always, then the colorist. And it, while it's being colored, someone else is lettering it, usually at the same time. And then post-production, of course, the editor is kind of shepherding this whole thing. If you fall into the trap of thinking, well, my part comes first, so everyone kind of works for me, that's not good. You need to be part of the team the whole way. And usually how it should go is you write your script, goes to the editor, they give you feedback, you revise, it goes to the penciler. They send you layouts, usually very rough. Thumbnails. Yeah, rough thumbnails of what they intend to do on the page, just to make sure everything's making sense. Sometimes I'll get a page of layouts back in which I realize, oh, this page is too cramped, or I didn't leave them room to do the specific thing. Or sometimes I'll see something like a different perspective that I was not envisioning, but works much better. Or an artist will add a panel or take a panel away or whatever. They'll make little changes based on what they think works best. And those are almost always improved. If something is not an improvement, like let's say that they accidentally left out a character or they focus too much on the characters and not enough on the environment. If there's a panel in which the environment is what matters, there's something in the description that really that the reader needs to see because if something is coming up later, you need to call that out in layouts so they don't put in a lot of time to do in the to, to do into doing the, uh, the careful pencils and then be like, hey, this thing shouldn't be there or this whole perspective is all wrong or whatever. It needs to be called out in layouts so that you're saving them time later. So you kind of collaborate. Sometimes you call out something that needs to be different in the pencils, but just as often I see things that I should change. I mean like, okay, here's a way that I screwed you without, without realizing it. And so now I need to go back and change the script a little bit to make your job easier on this page. You shouldn't just use the layouts as a chance to call out someone else's decisions. It's a chance for you to question your own as well. And then when the pencil pencils come back, maybe there's a little facial expression or something just like slightly off or the wrong person is speaking or something should be more in motion or whatever. You just you kind of jam on the pencils before it gets inked. And then of course you and the penciler should both have a say in the colors when they come back. There should always be a, a discussion happening. You know, it can't just be my part's done. Now I'm going to cash my check and move on to the next thing. Now you mentioned that you wanted to be a comics artist first off. So do you ever provide thumbnails for your scripts to people or do you completely take that out of there? No, typically not. I think m most artists would consider that kind of micromanaging mm -hmm. for me to actually draw them scratch versions of what I want them to do. I don't want them to feel like they're just my art monkey. I expect you to do what I say. It seems to me it's a little too much to show them what I want. Very often I'll send art rep or photo rep if there's a specific thing. Like Alien, a lot of that canon is already well established. If there's a ship that we're going to see in an issue that we've already seen in another story, in a movie or in another comic somewhere or whatever, I'll be like, hey, this is a Bougainville class military cruiser. Here's what that looks like. Here's some some photos from this video game or whatever it is to make sure that it fits in with other stories that have been told already and that the, the reader sees these Easter eggs and feels appreciated and respected. And plus, I want to save the artist time. If we just made up ships that don't make any sense with stuff that's already out there, then nothing makes sense and it just makes the world messy. Try to keep it all in canon. Or if there's a very specific kind of monster or device or whatever that I'm envisioning that for which there is no reference yet because it's not out there, I'll kind of help them see what I'm seeing 
by finding art reference online. Like, here's kind of what I was thinking for this. And I always try to chase stuff like that with, but do whatever you want. Here's what I was envisioning, but feel free to take the liberties you need. Or if you would rather do this other thing, they know what they're good at. The artist knows what their skills are better than I do. I always try to do some research and look at their earlier issues so I can see where their strengths lie and what they like to draw so I can see what I can do to make this a good experience for them. I always want to give them as much stuff as I can to make them enjoy the book and feel like it's theirs. I want them to feel that ownership. So again, so it feels like a collaboration and not just me bossing them around or like, hey, here's a, a field of horses and I expect you to draw. Horses are kind of this stereotypical pain in the ass thing for artists to draw. You don't want to give them horses unless you really need it. And some people have other things. Like I asked Phil Hester, my first Superman stuff post Future State was with Phil Hester. And he's this really great dude and kind of an artist artist. He's been around a long time and just knows a ton. I asked him early on what he likes to draw or doesn't like to draw. And he said, if we could not do any carnivals, that'd be great. I really don't like drawing carnivals. I'm like, that's interesting. That's very specific. He's like, yeah, there was a, I had, there was some gig that I did a long time ago. They had us try out by having us do these pages from a carnival. It was such a big pain in the ass. I prefer not to do that if there's a choice. <laughs> like, okay, noted. And it's funny because in the future state stuff, I did kind of have a page like that. It wasn't literally a carnival, but it was almost like a street festival thing where there's a lot of people milling around. And I was like, huh, I hope I didn't screw over Mikkel when I wrote this page. But yeah, usually they'll have a thing like, uh, I don't like doing really detailed urban backgrounds, or I don't like doing horses, or I, I really love drawing cars or people or guns or whatever. People usually have some kind of a preference. I try to let that inform what I'm doing. I just did a story with Layla DeLuca, and she's awesome. I love her work. And I asked her that question, and I'd already written the, the story that we we're going to do. Before I knew who the artist was going to be, I wrote the thing with the intention of tweaking it when I found out who it would be. And found out it would be Lila. I wrote her what she wanted. And she's like, I really love drawing people and like outdoorsy kind of scenes if we could. Not huge crowds maybe, but like people where I can have opportunities to show facial expressions and things. And I had this scene at the very beginning where somebody's walking down this crowded city street. And then I went back and I was like, you know, backspace, backspace, backspace. This guy is walking alone in the park in the snow. <laughs> like, I, you know, I just, I made like this kind of central parky type environment so that they felt more at home and could really stretch their legs. And then it worked out great. It pages are not beautiful i'm really glad we did it that way i'm gonna start to touch into the superman stuff for no obvious reason but at new york comic-con you actually did a panel with stephanie phillips mm -hmm. and i was sitting there and you said something about superman that stuck with me since and it basically was the way you described him i kind of want to hear you say it again basically how you see superman well forgive me if this does not line up quite with what i said before but to me superman is the antithesis of the old cliche absolute power corrupts absolutely to me superman has practically absolute power. He wields it with absolute compassion and humility. And that to me is at the core of who he is. The power to do anything, but has absolute compassion and humility. Everyone has kind of hung their hat on, on the word hope with Superman, largely in my opinion, because of the way that it, it's made very important in the Man of Steel film. And hope is another great word to associate with Superman, but for me, it's compassion and humility. By definition, more than us, but he sees himself as less than us. He serves all of us. He embodies the idea of service. Yeah, that's how I see him. I see him as the person of absolute power wields it with absolute compassion and humility. That's who he is for me. And every issue should show that. In every issue, I try to show some kind of a moment in which he makes that character clear, where he has some little, even if it's just a super brief, it can be like just one word balloon, or it could be like a page or two, some kind of a little monologue or a phrase in which he just makes us kind of shake our fist like, yes, like, why can't everyone be like that? I want to be like that. I try to put something like that in every in every issue, in every story. There's one like that when he's fighting Mongol for the first time in, in the battle that he ultimately loses. Spoilers. The crowd of slaves is chanting Mongol's name. So they're fighting and then Mongol says, you hear them? You're here to free them and they're chanting my name. Like they want me to kill you. That's power. They don't want your help. And they didn't ask you to come here. And then Superman lands this one great hit and his Mongol's in the dust. And Superman looks down on him. He said, one of them did. That was enough reason for him to cross the galaxy with the team to take him down because one person came to him and said, help me. I want to see a moment like that in every book. And I want us all to be like that. Now, if I can ask Kyle, how did I put it in the panel? Extremely close. And basically it was that. It was the humility line as what I was fishing for, to be honest, for probably a TikTok clip. But really, you thoroughly understand Superman. And when I heard you say it now for a second time too, it's just like, that's exactly correct. There is absolutely nothing I would change about the way you described it. Oh, it's just, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Whenever I see somebody depict him in like a way that is aggressive or cruel or with any kind of ego at all, I just kind of pile that away. Like, okay, well, this whole story is just fan fiction now because that's not how he is. There's some story I read somewhere once. Actually, do you know who wrote it? I'm not going to 
say. There was a story in which somebody was talking about somebody that was better than Superman at something. And he said something like, better than me. And I was like, well, this whole story is bullshit now. Because that just doesn't jive with what Superman would say or believe. He didn't see himself that way. He's here to serve everyone else. That power that he wields is not his. It's in service of everyone else. Recently, I did a sign. Well, not exactly a signing. So I had COVID not too long ago. And I was supposed to speak at this LitCon thing at school. And then I couldn't go because I was sick. I was like, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't go. I'm so positive. We did it through Google Meet or something. And I was supposed to sign these books. And everyone was supposed to get a free book. And then I was like, well, we, I cannot do this. I really want these kids to get these books. So one of the librarians that was working this thing gathered all the books that I was going to give to everyone, signed, got sticky notes from all the kids, what they wanted me to write in there, and brought them to my house and dropped them off like food at the leper colony. You know, like just left it on my front step and then ran away. So I brought everything in and I signed them and some of the sticky notes wanted specific things so i was expecting was like make it out to james but some of them were like write something really inspirational or like what's your favorite superman line or whatever so it took forever because i didn't want to tell the kids like no it's just my name that's all i'm doing i try to put some real thought into it and one of them was like i'm having a hard time getting motivated tell me something motivational that superman would say or something like that i was like damn dude just pressure like this matters and now i'm given an opportunity to say something that this person could remember every day potentially or i could fuck it up and this could mean nothing and it's kind of how i feel when i'm writing superman too it was a great honor and a privilege to write Superman and I want it to matter. Anyway, so I thought about it and I don't remember exactly what I wrote, but it's something like, this is how we earn our keep. I think I said something like that. The way we earn our keep is by using our talents, skills, and advantages to help whoever we can. So yeah, I tried to say something that I thought Superman would say or express an approach to life that I think Superman embodies. That's one phrase I think that embodies who he is. I can see that either dialogue or a caption box in a Superman book for sure. Now, was Superman always the goal? Did you always have your eyes on writing Superman or even drawing Superman way back in the day? Was he the guy for you or did you just kind of fall into it a little bit? Superman is kind of one facet of who I want to be as a person and also who I want to be as a writer. It's not all I want to do. Superman is a character I definitely wanted to write and I could not believe it when I got the call. But I didn't question it. It wasn't this giddy hands in the air a moment it was just kind of like hands on the table like okay got it we're gonna do this it's like putting on a pack like all right let's do it i know what i'm gonna do i know exactly what i'm gonna do because i have such a clear vision in my mind of who superman is and i want people to see that i don't want people to see the version of superman like what do you mean better than me i want to see the version that i see in my head that is part christopher reeve and yes part cavill and part kurt swan part frank quietly there are aspects of all these different stories that, that sum up who superman really is who he really really is and i i know who that is and i want to express that in a comic no i can and when i got that opportunity i couldn't wait to get started now there are other voices in my head too that matter to me as well for a long time a lot of the stories that i wrote were about america in some way and even now there's a lot of that in my stuff for a while that was the driving force of my work like last sons of america warlords of appalachia and low road west so far my creator-owned work at boom studios those are very much about america and how we can be better than we are and how we can be more and how we should be better and things that i love but things that i want to change i consider myself a patriot and stuff like that matters to me a lot too and that also kind of bleeds into my superman work i definitely believe in truth justice in the american way like the old adage that has recently been changed to better tomorrow but it doesn't mean what some people think it means in my opinion but when i hear truth justice in the american way to me that does not mean that superman is trying to spread american influence around the world or the, the universe or that he's trying to spread our way of life like a conquistador you know like it's there's, there's none of that and even his beliefs are not attached to any particular time in american history or to an administration it's not like his opinion Opinions change with elections. To me, the ideas that embody what America was supposed to be is supposed to be the American dream. The idea that all people are created equal, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the idea that we all have the same opportunities in life, that idea that we should care about people less fortunate than us, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the poem below the Statue of Liberty, those things to me sum up the approach that Superman believes in. That's what he's trying to achieve. And anyone could hear what I just said and rightfully say, yeah, but that's not who we are. That's not what America is. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know that we're not perfect but i believe that we can achieve it someday and that's what superman believes so to me the idea of, of my stories being about america and how we can be better that has definitely informed my superman stuff there's other parts of me too i really love the alien movies that's a very different itch to scratch that's all about the deep fundamental mistrust of corporations <laughs> and like a existential dread you know like a very different thing i, I love cormac mccarthy's work this existential bleakness but also the beauty in, inherent in his writing i love the crime work of ed brubaker 
Baker and Elmore Leonard. That's stuff I want to do too. I've got other stories that are very like dark crime kind of stories. I've got a Batman story in me that I'm dying to tell. I've got really dark horror stories I want to tell. I've got a kid's book I'm putting together. There's a lot of stuff I want to do, but Superman was definitely one of the tent poles I wanted to put my mark on. And I still can't believe I get to do it, but I'm so grateful for it. And it's a huge privilege. I'm trying not to waste a moment of it. Very well said. Very well said. Definitely. I have a rather nerdy question about heat vision. But in the Shadow of Reed story arc, Jonathan Kent, you got creative with the heat vision. A heat vision detonation. Mm -hmm. He had a hyperviolet light. I just wanted to pick your brain. Anything you could tell us about the process of coming up with that? Because I thought that was a really nice touch to push that character another step forward. Well, thanks. I did a little nerdy research into actual spectrums of light and where they overlap and which ones lead to what. And I was like, what if there's other subtle levels in between that we don't know about yet? And the reason I was doing all this, because I don't want John to just be a carbon copy of his dad. I want him to be different. Not just the backstory. For one thing, he's half human. How would that be different? Plus, there's this idea in any kind of creative field or achievement driven competition everyone stands on the shoulder of giants right but you see it in the records that are set and broken and set again you see people taking something that's been done by their predecessors and taking it a step further i mean in some ways superman will always be the greatest like clark Kent's never going to be surpassed he's freaking superman and no one's ever going to like replace him like well now we got a better one but i do want there to be some of that standing on the shoulder of giants kind of thing that I think we would see in real life. How does the next generation take it forward? And I like the idea. In my mind, John is a very creative kid and I could see him kind of playing around with his powers. Like Superman's already kind of decided what he's capable of. He's getting older. He's not like old, but he knows what he can do. His ideas about his own abilities are kind of calcified, but John is still kind of playing around and figuring things out. And I like the idea that he's known that he had heat vision for a while. What if he finds new subtleties to it that, that Superman never did? I imagine that my own son will do that will find great about was I never had any interest in or find that he can do things I can never do. As a dad, seeing my young son grow up and somebody who is in various creative pursuits trying to take things further than have been taken before in music and also in the art form of comics, it just made sense. I don't want to just make John stronger, like physically stronger than his dad. He's still kind of young, but also it's kind of an ordinary thing. But the idea of heat vision came up. Well, what if there was more subtlety to it? What if he could do really cool shit with it that his dad never tried? The idea of the detonations to me, I thought was pretty cool. I wanted to explore and I wanted John to be the one to kind of save the day in the end in that story, in that Shadow Breed story, where it takes both of them to do it in the end. Because the whole thing, I only had three issues. They're like, you got three issues before Tom Taylor comes on. Because I had the Future State books and then the Phil Hester thing that crossed over from action into Superman. And then we had the action comics ongoing, which became the War World Saga. And then just three issues is all I had in Superman before it turned into Son of Kal-El. It's like, damn, dude, that's not much. And the whole point of it was to set up Tom well for his run to make John kind of the focus, to focus on the father's son of the whole thing and then kind of hand it off to John. I couldn't have John be a supporting character. I needed John to have something to do and show that his dad loves and respects him and is proud of him. And the whole thing is a literal love letter from Superman to his son. And just kind of as a reminder of this awesome thing that he did once. It's a letter that John is reading after Superman has left Earth for War World. I wanted John to kind of be the hero of the story and to have this awesome power that his dad never quite explored. Sorry, it was a long answer. Great answer. The father-son dynamic was very well done. I mean, Thank really you. very well. I did enjoy that and the future state stuff. I enjoyed that story as well. Thank you, man. Yeah, the father-son stuff, man. I read my son those chapters and that two-page spread that Scott drew so beautifully, they're flying towards that world. And I know there's a ton of comics in which people are talking in space, but there's no sound in space. I try to be careful not to have any sound effects or speech when they're in space. And so that's all voiceover. They can't talk. So they're flying a long way, but they can't speak to each other. Superman just kind of hangs back and he's just watching his son fly and just thinking how awesome he is and how much he loves him. And I feel that all the time. When I walk my son to school, I don't get to do it as often as I like to because you Usually I've got like work or something, but on a day when I don't have to go in or I have a later start or something, I'll walk him to school and sometimes I'll just hand him, just kind of look at him, and just admire how awesome he is and just think about all the cool shit he does or says and just think about how much I love him, you know? I'll just watch him doing whatever he's doing in the house. I'll just take a couple of minutes and just watch him and just kind of, just kind of soak in love. Those two pages are meant to kind of capture that and Scott did an awesome job on that spread. There's a line, it was something like uh, in the vacuum of space, I could think the clearest, something like that. Yeah, that... I think that spread is actually my Facebook background. 
background now. Let me uh, pull it up real quick. The vacuum of space is where I hear my thoughts the clearest. Since we couldn't speak, I hung back a bit and just watched you fly. And then you were running through the tall grass again, chasing butterflies and barn swallows, pretending you were one of them. Back then, I'd come home every day to a bright-eyed little boy who ran up to me and bear hugged me around the middle. He'd tell me all about a story you'd read or pull me outside to teach me a game you'd made up. Then one day you had an adventure of your own and then another. You grew up faster than we expected or wanted for you. Now my little barn swallow is soaring through the Andromeda galaxy, your cells igniting with the power of a supernova. You are a miracle, Jonathan Kent. You'll do things I never could, but I'll always miss reading to you as you fall asleep, feeling your little chest rise and fall as I brush the hair out of your eyes, imagining how amazing your life will be. Yeah, that's how I feel about that kid every day, man. Yeah, you yeah. definitely wrote that for your kid. Yeah, that's he's beautiful. what our life looks like. We just hang out, we're best friends, and he's just the best. All my faults are made right in him. That's amazing, really. How old is he now? Eight. Getting old fast. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's getting big fast. My own relationship with my own dad kind of sucked, and I feel like this made me really appreciate my own kid a lot. We are unnaturally close, like strangely close, and I feel like it's because I just never had that, you know, and I just really wanted it, and, and now we've got it, and it's the best. That's all you can really hope for. Yeah. Sorry to get all mushy here. I know we're here to talk about nerds. No, stuff. you're good. We're about to take a sharp left turn, so it's okay <laughs> to get mushy for a little bit. <laughs> so it sounds like you've been a fan of comics for a while, and you mentioned earlier that you're a fan of Alien, yeah. and I'm really curious. You probably grew up reading the Dark Horse books, and now that Alien is at Marvel, does Marvel have like a tighter leash on that because it is a licensed property? Are you allowed to draw from any of the Dark Horse stuff or just kept within these lines that you have to stick the story with and you're just letting your alien fanboy go wild? You know, I did not grow up reading Dark Horse stuff. I found those later because I was so in the sticks. I never went to a legit comic store ever until later in life because they just weren't around. I mean, as far as I knew. I mean, maybe there was one in town but I never knew about it. When I was a kid, I got all my comics from my dad. He went to garage sales and flea markets and just looking for cheap shit. We'd come back with boxes of ripped up comics. Most of them were very old even then. I would read those. And sometimes if there was some reason to have it, like a, a treat or whatever, I could get a new one from a grocery store, a drugstore, spinner rack. Back then you could get comics. Newsstand. Yeah, newsstand stuff. You could get new DC, more Gladstone or whatever, like the, the cartoony ones, like the forerunners Archie and the Kales and stuff. Yeah. Those kind of things. You can get those, where I was growing up, it was like hy V was the name of the, the grocery store chain. You could get comics from hy V or from a drugstore. And that's where all my stuff came from. I didn't know comic stores were even a thing until way later. And then I was in Kentucky after that, and we were even more in the sticks. It was an hour anywhere. Like Dark Horse, I didn't know they were making Alien comics. I watched the movies back then, and I thought they were fucking awesome. <laughs> and I was just obsessed with them. And I would just, you know, ignore my geometry teacher and just draw. I had the idea that, okay, well, the aliens all look kind of human because they come from us. But what if they came from other stuff? Would they still look human? I just had the idea that they would look like other stuff if they came out of other animals. And I would draw stuff like that. Like, what would it look like coming out of an eagle or, or a snake or a dragon or whatever? Then when Alien 3 came out, and that was basically confirmed, I just lost it. I did the straight up like Chuck Liddell screaming in a cornfield thing, like just screaming. I had like a so excited that like it was basically made for me, man. Like all the stuff I've been drawing, like we see a quadruped alien and it was just the coolest, coolest thing. Anyway, I digress. So I didn't know about any of the comics at that time. I didn't know until much later. At some point I heard that there had been a comic in which Hicks and Newt had lived. And then I started finding out more about the, the alien versus predator comics. At some point became aware of them, like in college, I think. But as far as whether Marvel has a tight leash. Most of my notes don't come from Marvel. Most of my notes come from 20th century. I mean, Marvel editors are still reading my stuff, but we're mostly on the same page. I just don't get a lot of notes from them regarding story, partly because I'm always the biggest alien nerd in the room. I know the lore pretty well, but sometimes I'll get notes from 20th century people. Usually it's a conservative thing trying to rein me in on something. Yeah, and, pull uh, that leash a little bit back so you don't get too into the wild. Not trying to jump the shark or anything. I'm not going to put my eagle alien from when I was you know, 12 in a comic or anything. I'm trying to make small moves. But there are things I want to see that excite me. A lot of that stuff actually revolves around the androids. I think mm -hmm. the synths are awesome, are a really cool aspect of the lore, and I think that that was made even cooler by the prequels. Prometheus really gave us new levels and layers to all that stuff. The comparisons between the life that we've created in the synths versus the fact that we were made by the engineers, you know, how David created, that's debatable. I don't think David created the xenomorphs. He created some xenomorphs, but there's the big boss relief on the wall that has the neomorph in the big, like, Christ pose on the wall. Mm -hmm. The engineers have seen things before, so to me, 
see there's still this timeless ancient evil thing that predates anything we see in the films. I really like the new kind of almost like sibling rivalry we see now between xenomorphs and humans and synths and that whole vibe. I love how they brought synths into the story in Prometheus and Covenant. Anyway, sometimes they'll get pushback, but the pushback almost always comes from 20th century, almost never from Marvel. Marvel has been pretty cool about it. And 20th century has been cool too. Like for the most part, everyone's digging what I'm doing. Uh, now and again, there's a little pushback. I'm trying to think of an example that I could tell you without spoiling anything. So there's a scene in Bloodlines in the first issue in which we see a flashback and we see a soldier strung up in the nest and the guy's got a face hugger on his face, another one on his ass and another one on his crotch. And you know, it's gnarly, <laughs> right? I got hard pushback on that. And they're like, nope, these things attach only to the face. And I was like, actually, if you go back and read David's journals from Covenant, you'll find there's this one thing that he discovered on the planet that it's any port in a storm kind of approach. David describes finding this thing. Like he has drawings of this, almost like a predecessor to the face hugger, like a proto face hugger that's not quite as codified as the face huggers that we all know and love. And said that they kind of hide in the bushes and shit. And when it finds David, when David's like wandering around, it runs up his leg and there's a moment of hesitation when it finds that David doesn't have any orifices down there. And that hesitation kind of helps David to catch it or kill it or whatever he did. To me, it made sense that there is precedent. Plus, the whole reason that these things are supposed to be the perfect organism, quote unquote, the perfect survivor, they're so versatile. They can impregnate anything in theory and become a xenomorph version of that thing and then is well suited to exist in that environment. So something that, you know, does well in a human environment with oxygen that's not the perfect xenomorph form in some other planet where it should be something else. And some, not everything's going to have a face. So it makes sense to me that they would attach to whatever. And if there's more face huggers than organisms, that they might double or triple up and go buffet style, family style. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, that was an example of pushback I got from the studio in which we had a conversation. In the end, we did get the crotch huggers. So that's good. I'm just going to call them crotch huggers for now on. They're no longer face huggers. <laughs> there you go. To shift gears a little bit again, Last Sons of America in development on Netflix. Actually, that uh, information is a little old. Apologies. Netflix ultimately passed on it, but it is still in development in theory. They're trying to find financing for it. The director, the producer, and Peter Dinklage, those guys are all attached still. Okay. That's half good, half bad news. <laughs> yeah. Netflix's stock is down anyway. You don't want <laughs> That's that. right. In their faces. They missed out. If you had a question about TV development stuff, I mean, Last Sons is still out there trying to get made. And there's also Smoketown, my book at Scout Comics. That is actively in development too. So that's pretty cool. I can't tell you a lot about what's happening with it, but it's in a good place. Okay. I'll take it. So your independent stuff has been with Scout and mostly Boom. And yeah. obviously you've worked for the big two. What would you say is the biggest difference between working for Boom against the big two? I'm just curious what it's like working for those companies. I mean, Boom discovered me as far as printed books. When I went with them, I had a web comic that was still coming out weekly, but they were my first printed book. It was a good experience. I mean, the money wasn't great because I, I was a total nobody, but the editor, Eric Harburn, we got along super great. He's a really awesome editor, has you know great instincts for story. And he and I got along really well. And with the, the high ups, the company too, they, everyone was super cool to me and had a great time. They are definitely creator owned driven. These days they have a lot of licensed stuff. They did then too. At the time they had Kong, Planet of the Apes and Adventure Time. Kaboom imprint has some cool mm -hmm. kid stuff. And of course the Jim Henson stuff is at Arkea, their other imprint. Everything that Arkea touches is worth reading in my opinion, but that's just me. Yeah, yeah, they're great for sure. I like that they kind of maintain a bullpen of editors and the editors are super solid and had a really good time working with them. It's not the same as DC and Marvel because DC and Marvel are all about protecting their brand, their characters, just shepherding the characters and making sure they're honored. And Boom is more about finding crazy new points of view and crazy new stories. Like Aftershock's tagline is uh, read dangerously. And I would say Boom's approach is more like read adventurously, you know, like, I don't know. Like Discover, just, which used to be their tagline. Yeah, exactly. But like, that's kind of their approach is like adventure, you know, let's see what's out there. Let's come up with really cool new fun ideas. Not quite as edgy as Aftershock. Like Aftershock's had a lot of success with horror. I mean, now Boom has actually kind of steered more in a horror direction since then too. Stuff like friggin' what's it called? Something's killing, killing children. Yeah, children. exactly. Yeah. Killing the children is a great example. Psy, Spirier, my friend, did some really cool stuff there too. Yeah, so Boom just kind of had this fun spirit of adventure to their line at the time and it's trying to do the, like the smart, cool, distinct versions of things. And DC and Marvel, while also trying to take big swings, take chances, are definitely all about protecting their character and 
making sure that they're consistent and still portrayed in a very consistent way. But man, I gotta say, I've had a great time doing it all. When I first started, I didn't know I was gonna get shots like I'm getting now as far as Superman and Alien and all that. But if I was only gonna be doing creator-owned, I still would have had a great time. I would have been content just doing creator-owned because it's super rewarding. But I really love doing licensed stuff too. My first shot at licensed work was Adventure Time, just a short story that I had never watched Adventure Time before. And it gave me a chance to discover this new IP that I didn't really know. At the time, they were like, hey, you had any interest in doing an Adventure Time story? Do you like that show? Yeah, dude, I love Adventure Time. And it was like a, a complete lie. I didn't know <laughs> shit about Adventure Time. I went and just watched like 24 straight hours of Adventure Time, just like just mainlined it. And man, that's a weird show. I'd been aware of it and I'd seen it. I'm like, that looks kind of weird. But when you really got into it, you realize there's lore there. That world has rules. Mm -hmm. And those rules are super crazy and out, but the world is very consistent and makes sense in its own way. I have a lot of respect for that show now, and I would not have discovered that show if I hadn't gotten that shot. I never would have seen it if I hadn't gotten that shot to write it. And then later, I got the same kind of opportunity at DC with Aquaman. I didn't know much about Aquaman. I'd grown up mostly with Batman and Superman. Of course, I knew who Aquaman was, and I'd read a lot of stories that had him in it, but I didn't have a lot of stories that were very Aquaman-centric, and it gave me this opportunity to really go down the rabbit hole and just do this deep dive on Aquaman, everything from the New 52 on, but then before that as well. There's a lot of really cool stuff. And give me a chance to really fall in love with that character and find out what makes him great and why some people love him so much. And I've had opportunities since then. They just announced the Green Lantern thing I'm doing. I discovered a really like a deep love of Jon Stewart and who that character is and what he stands for. I recently got to speak at West Point about storytelling and also about music. And I met one of the biggest Green Lantern fans ever. And I told him, this hasn't been announced yet, but I'm going to be doing a Jon Stewart story here soon. And he lost his mind. The biggest Jon Stewart fan ever. He kind of looks like Jon Stewart, but he doesn't just like Jon Stewart because he identifies with him like physically. He he told me why he loves Green Lantern so much. And it kind of made sense why he's at West Point. He talks about serving as something bigger than himself and how he's not just a part of the Justice League. He's also this whole other organization that he's a part of, this fighting force that's been around for centuries that he's a part of. And it, suddenly his devotion to the U.S. Army and to the U.S. and his idea of service just as a cadet made all the sense in the world. He told me about how the first class rings anywhere were at West Point. Now, when he graduates, you get to design the ring. He's going to make his look as much like a Green Lantern ring as he possibly can. He's just like this huge fan, super cool guy. It was just really fun to jam with him on that character, but also it was just really fun to get to know that character as well as I do now. And how he might be my favorite Green Lantern, just knowing as much about the character as I do and talking to other people who are so devoted to him and hearing their takes on him. It's just an opportunity I wouldn't have had, you know. Now, Alien, I didn't need any help falling in love with Alien. But sometimes I get an opportunity to write something new, and I'm really glad when I get those opportunities. It gives me an opportunity to fill holes in my game as a writer and as a fan. With that, let's wrap it up with a final question, a nice easy one. So you got Green Lantern, something coming up. What else do you have coming up? You're not supposed to tell us even better. And if you want to say where everyone can follow you. Sure. You know. Action Comics is still coming out monthly. Next issue is 1043, I believe. And that's the first issue of War World Revolution, which is the third arc in the, the War World Saga series so far. So that's ongoing. We got an action annual coming up that I co-wrote with a friend of mine that I'm super stoked about. I don't think it's announced yet, so I probably shouldn't say. I could be wrong about that, but it's coming out soon. Alien is also coming out quasi-monthly. There's been some paper delays on that book, unfortunately, but we are kind of wrapping up what we're kind of considering the first season, quote unquote, with issue 12 that's coming out soon. I think it comes out in June. And then the annual, which is Salvador La Roca's final issue as the artist. And then we get into what, kind of what we're considering season two. We kick off I want to say in August. And that's going to be the beginning of not a new direction because it does build on the subplots that we've been seeding in in the first season of Alien. But I'm really stoked for the new direction for the new characters that we're about to introduce. So the second arc of Alien is about to finish up, Alien Revival. And then the third arc comes up and I'm stoked about that. Yeah, I've got, I'm doing a Dark Crisis Green Lantern that I'm really excited about with Jon Stewart. All, Worlds Without a Justice League Green Lantern, I think is the issue. I'm doing another Dark Crisis thing coming out soon. I can't tell you what that is, but it's a part of another little group of stories. I'm doing another series an ongoing series that is not yet announced i really can't say i'm sorry it's, it's going to be another month or two before we announce it but I'm really stoked for it no one's going to expect it for sure and i'm really excited to get the chance to do it are um, you allowed to say the company no if i say the company you'll probably know what it is okay. i've said too much already i just pitched a crime noir super dark crime story to a company that was very well received and i'm pretty confident it's going to be getting made somewhere that's super duper early so i can't say anything about that but i'm going to be getting back into creator own space i can say that i've let myself get distracted with <laughs> licensed books i've got these opportunities to do these books that I just love doing 
like action comics, like Alien, like this other thing that's coming out. But I've kind of taken my eye off creator own stuff for too long. My last one that I think that I did was The Last God, which has been off shelves for a little bit. Now there's another one that I want to do real bad. So that's coming out soon. As far as where to find me, I have a website, philipkennedyjohnson.com. Two L's and Philip. I'm on Facebook under my full name. I'm at Twitter at Philip K. Johnson. I'm at Instagram with my full name, underscores in between. Look me up. Well, can't thank you enough. Uh, everything you've done so far, everything I've read, I'm just overly impressed with everything. Oh, thanks, brother. I appreciate that. I really enjoy everything you do. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Hope to have you on again one day. Yeah. Thanks again. Hey, man. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm going to Kyle's. We're hitting up a bunch of comic book stores. I'm going to my friend in Philly's. So I'm going to my friend in Baltimore. So I'll be going to Third Eye. Yeah. I'm super excited about going to Third Eye. But there's also a lot of other great stores around there, like Twilights and Cosmic. Yeah. Nice. Goal is to hit 30 plus stores. <laughs> nice, dude. That's cool. When you get to Third Eye, I mean, you probably know this. There's a great game store next door that's just as big and just as awesome. I got some cool shit for my son there. And they also have a great LP selection. Don't tell me that. So that building that they're in used to be like the city municipal shit, the water plant. For all of Annapolis? I think so, yeah. Oh, God. And so at some point, they moved out of there. One big ass building, but they're like these three three adjoining spaces. And at some point, Third Eye got the lease for the ones on both ends. It was Third Eye Games was on the other side. Yeah, there's Third Eye Comics on one side and Third Eye Hobbies and Games on the other side. Mm -hmm. And then there's like Anne Arundel County, whatever, or Annapolis Municipal, whatever, in the middle. So in the back, you see all these county utility trucks and stuff. At some point, I think Steve's going to crowd out that middle thing, too. And he's going to take the whole building. I think it's going to be another year or two, but at some point, he's going to take the whole building and do something really special with it. It's already pretty awesome. Anyway, I should run. I still got this gun to my head on this book I'm writing. But it's great to meet you guys. and We'll do it again for sure.